Digital site records have become essential in archaeology. Large amounts of diverse information can be archived, shared, used, and reused in many different ways, including in some ways that may not yet have been invented, for examining and exploring ancient sites and their associated data sets. While the digital technologies have been developing and changing rapidly, Several different debates and opinions have developed about the best practice that archaeologists should follow when working with digital site records. I prefer to focus on the basic core principles that could be applied in any situation, regardless of the particular form or format of site recording, and regardless of using any specific hardware or software package. By understanding these core principles, anyone can maximize the use of digital site records. Most importantly, I learned first to ask one simple question. What information do I want to communicate? Based on my answer to this question, then I can ascertain how to approach the site recording. Quite often, I will want to record the location and shape of an archaeological site. I will want to discern the mapped points and shapes clearly and at a meaningful scale of view. Additionally, I will want to compare these findings with the information in other maps and geographic databases. Furthermore, I will want to know how the mapped points or shapes relate with all of the other information that I have observed at the site. I can achieve these goals effectively with traditional paper documents and using old-fashioned mapping equipment of a compass and a tape measure. As long as I can link my map with the known fixed points in the world, then I can digitize the results into a modern geographic information system. I can measure and connect my map to a geological survey marker, to the corners of a road intersection, or to the corners of a building that show clearly in other maps or in satellite imagery. As long as the location is clear and fixed, then I can know for sure about the mapping coordinates in whatever coordinate system, scale, and units of measurement might be preferred. I make my maps in a closed loop, connecting back to my origin point so that I can prove the level of accuracy and precision of my map. If I am in a place where I can use a global positioning system or data logger, then I can be much more efficient in my site mapping. I can record numerous points rapidly. The level of precision showing in the instrument usually would be exceptionally fine, down to one centimeter, but the accuracy of this point could be problematic. While the data point resembles the tip of a dart, the dart may have hit anywhere within a large target zone. This large target zone is the region of accuracy that typically is plus or minus 20 centimeters, but sometimes it could be much larger in certain conditions. A global positioning system requires a view of the sky for satellite reception, and these conditions might not be possible beneath thick vegetation cover, inside a cave, or near the base of a tall mountain or cliff. If the satellite reception is poor or perhaps absent, then I cannot be confident about the accuracy of a mapping coordinate point. Instead, I would need to follow the same principles as with a traditional paper map of connecting out to a known fixed point. Furthermore, I would advise to collect multiple points, ideally through a closed loop mapping approach, and to cross check with traditional compass and tape measurements as a way to test the accuracy of the results. Remote sensing, such as through LIDAR or light detection and ranging, can reveal the outlines of archaeological sites or features in contrast against their surrounding background terrain. Especially useful are the cases of identifying the background signal of a forest cover or other layers of obscurement in an environment. The associated signal or signature within the LIDAR then can be removed, thereby exposing the natural ground surface beneath the cover and showing the outlines of whatever artificial constructions might be there. Currently, this technology works well for showing large scales of sites that are on or near the ground surface. In whatever manner a site map has been recorded, the result always can be digitized, and the digital version can be compatible with several other possibilities. In my work, I have used my site mapping coordinates as the basis for creating 
three-dimensional computer models and other output. After I can record the real site points accurately, then I can enter the relevant information into whatever computer software package might be available. In this approach, I have been able to update my existing site records with new digital technologies and opportunities, without anyone needing to return back to the site for mapping and recording the place all over again. In addition to these issues of mapping coordinates, usually I will want to record several observations about the site setting, the internal material components, the places where I excavated, and many other attributes. In these respects, a digital data logger greatly can reduce the bulk of the equipment and supplies that I need to carry with me. Nonetheless, I could use traditional paper records and then later transfer those records into digital files for the purposes of longer-term storage and database management. In my work, I record the position of a site, the physical measurements, the raw materials, shapes of features, and so on. I can use my own standardized site form, or I could adjust to use whatever might be required by a local government office. Regardless of whatever form or format might be used, the information content should be the most important part of the work. A standardized site form might not even give the opportunity to record certain aspects of a site, especially if those aspects are outside the standard expectations or status quo of understanding. In those cases, of course I will want to modify the site form and add the relevant information. Nothing is wrong with recording more information toward a more useful final result. Something is wrong, though, when the site recording form or format becomes applied too rigidly and without allowing other observations to enter into the record. In a digital site record, I routinely add extra data fields so that I can include different information beyond the standard routine expectations. Among the most informative parts of any site record are the photographs or other imagery. Currently, nearly all site image records are digital right from the start, and the digital files are easy to manage and curate. For my older site records, however, I have invested in digitizing my old printed photographs, slides, and negatives. The same approach would be advisable for the older site records in most museums and archives. For each image in a site record, I indicate the reference number or file name, along with the date of recording, the angle of view, and other relevant information. I include a scale reference bar within the image, positioned in a place where I can see it clearly. After completing this basic documentation, then I can collect additional pictures without a scale reference bar in the way. In a digital site record, the imagery could be extensive, including numerous image files. With a digital camera device, I prefer to record multiple and redundant images from overlapping angles and distances. My purpose here is to create the baseline record as thoroughly as possible. One special advantage of a digital image file is the ability to experiment with the color, contrast, brightness, and other aspects. These experiments are useful for enhancing the clarity of an image and for highlighting certain details that might not have been obvious at first. Most importantly in these cases, the specific adjustments to the image should be mentioned as part of the record. Many image processing options are available, and most of those options will support useful results, such as when attempting to enhance the faint or faded portions of ancient rock art inside a dark cave. When recording multiple digital images, I have been successful with processing those images into photogrammetry projects or structure from motion projects. The core requirement is to identify key reference points that are consistent across each image and then to use those consistent points as the basis to create a three-dimensional model. My use of a standard reference scale bar is perfect for this approach, as long as I can keep the scale bar firmly in one place throughout the sequence of images. Ideally, I can include three scale bars as a way to establish the three-dimensional framework. Photogrammetry and structure from motion probably will continue to develop with new data processing and software options. Meanwhile, the underlying principles will remain the same about collecting multiple overlapping images with a consistent reference marker. 
Using different software over the course of some years now, I have been successful in creating these projects in several different situations. I find these projects to become incredibly useful as parts of the digital site records. Nonetheless, the greatest value derived from recording the original image files as the necessary basis for these other possible uses and output. Similar technologies can be applied in creating three-dimensional digital scans of objects or of entire sites. These results can be effective for capturing small details. Often, the same details could be captured through other options, such as by using a close-up lens or perhaps a microscope view with a high-resolution camera. Within the last few years, commercially available digital imagery technology has allowed abundant and detailed site records through still imagery and video files. The digital files all can be archived and curated as parts of the site records. These raw data files can be accessible for the public to view and potentially to use for various purposes and to process through different digital imagery options whenever they might become available. Meanwhile, the final products, such as through photogrammetry, structure from motion, or three-dimensional digital scans, certainly are valuable, but their fixed outputs might not be accessible for the public or adaptable with future technologies. Instead, the original data input can retain the best long-term values. I should stress that the most important part of a site record is the core information content, regardless of whatever might be the most recent or most popular recording technology. In this regard, the two key advantages of digital site records involve the efficiency of registering large amounts of data and the easier capacity for long-term archiving or curation. The possibilities of digital site records certainly will continue to change with new technologies and opportunities. What aspects do you find interesting or challenging and what would you like to see in digital site records? Thank you for watching here. I will see you in the next video.